Katie said, I'm going to be talking about a brief history of attribution in InfoSec. And I brought note cards because I took a lot of AP history in high school, and that's how I remember stuff. Um, like Katie said, uh, I just started as a principal analyst at FireEye on the cyber espionage team. Before that, I worked for BA Systems in the defense industrial base, and I did threat intelligence there for about four years. Um, before that, I spent about three years in the legislative and executive branch SOCs. And I also have a BA in international relations and a master's in, cyber, in security policy studies. Uh, I've been to a lot of InfoSec talks, and I learned one thing from them, and it's important to bring cat memes. So I brought two. I hope that was enough. <laughs> so today I want to talk to you guys about some common analytic mistakes that we've seen um, over, as Juan said, the very brief history of InfoSec. It goes back about 10 years. Uh, I want to examine the root causes of some of these mistakes and some of the cognitive biases that may have been in play. And what I want to do is highlight uh, our successes and the times that we've gotten it right, that we've identified analytic pitfalls, and we've avoided them successfully. And then I want to give everyone some practical takeaways. Um, so no matter what your skill level is, if you're just starting out, or if you've been here for a while, you'll have something to take home. Um, what I don't want to do today is name and shame. Uh, I don't want to call out individuals or companies on things that they may have done wrong in the past. Um, I don't think it's productive, and I don't want to stand up here and complain about our industry um, and the times that we may have gotten it wrong. I think it's more productive um, for us to highlight our successes as an industry. And um, I, I do have a few examples, just three, um, of times that we've gotten it wrong. Um, but I think you'll agree that they're at least worth talking about. Uh, so for this talk, I'm going to be using the diamond model. And the diamond model is a useful framework for categorizing the data that we collect when we're researching attribution. Uh, I'm not going to get too in the weeds with this model. I know people have preferences for which model they like or which one that they think is the most useful. Uh, but for our first purposes, I'm just going to be talking about it as a way to frame the data that we're using. When we're, when we're examining the root cause of attribution mistakes, a lot of the ones that I research um, I think can be traced to an over-reliance on three parts of the diamond model, either infrastructure-centric analysis, capability-centric, or victim-centric. And I think that the cognitive biases that stem from this over-reliance um, come at, the at, the, at a deficit to adversary analysis. Um, so we're going to kind of be going through all four of those. Um, and we're going to start with infrastructure. Um, infrastructure-centric analysis um, has a lot of uh, some of the basic research uh, mistakes that I want to go over. Um, and most of the mistakes that I observed um, when looking at historical, historical examples kind of stemmed from a fundamental misunderstanding of the data that we're trying to interpret. I'm going to start out with some really basic ones, and I think that we'll all recognize these errors as something that we've done or something that we've seen analysts struggle with in the past when they're just starting out. Um, so the first one should look pretty familiar to everyone. These are dynamic DNS providers. Uh, they're very popular with a number of different types of APT actors um, and incorrectly interpreting this data as actor-controlled infrastructure uh, rather than something that can be shared would lead us to come to inaccurate conclusions. Um, and this next example is also a pretty basic one. Uh, this is a sinkhole and it's one of my favorites, uh, this 58 IP. Basically, if it starts to look like China and the North Koreans are collaborating with Iran, you've probably come across a sinkhole. Um, and this next example I took from a Threat Connect blog, and I think it does a really great job of examining um, an example of domain resellers. Uh, so this example highlights a really common Chinese domain reseller that showed up in a lot of um, well-known APT blogs. And they correctly identified that this address isn't unique to any one APT adversary, but it's still a useful data point, uh, the fact that all of these actors are using uh, this Chinese reseller. And it's important to understand the context behind that. Uh, this next example is from a 2013 interview uh, with Dell SecureWorks. And I really like the way Joe Stewart uh, describes to Bloomberg the, the kind of activity that he's seeing. So he's seeing a number of primarily Chinese-speaking actors egressing from a large block of IPs that are based in Beijing. Um, he says that the actors have a variety of roles in cyber espionage operations, and they may or may not be working together. Um, and the groups that they're the groups that they're organizing themselves in are only tangentially related to one another. 
Um, the activity in the actual term Beijing group evolved uh, far beyond this initial interview, but I really like the way Joe highlights that uh, the actual IP egress point um, was a useful data point, but we really need to understand to be careful not to associate all actors with this one egress point. Um, the next example, uh, I know I said I wasn't going to highlight any, or call out any one person, but this one's fine. Uh, I pulled this from a DNC truther blog, uh, and they are attempting to discredit uh, CrowdStrike's analysis of um, the APT 28 and 29 report in the DNC. And I think this is a really good example of misinterpreting raw data in an intrusion and not by not truly understanding the source or the meaning behind this data. There are a lot of things that are wrong with this conspiracy theory, so I'm not gonna go into them, um, but I wanted to highlight their issues with timestamps and BT. Uh, to their credit, they actually emailed VirusTotal and sent us, like, posted a screenshot on their blog of VirusTotal's response. Um, so initially, they discount the idea that APT28 would have timestamped any of their malware for reasons that they don't really get into. Uh, but they also have an issue with some of the in-the-wild timestamps that they think have been mysteriously backdated. Uh, so I'm, I'm not interested in correcting tinfoil hats on the internet, <laughs> but uh, the actual screenshot that they posted, and Nick Carr does a good job of pointing out, we can actually learn uh, more about virus total, where virus total pulls this data so we can get a better understanding of the data that we're collecting. Um, so it turns out that in the wild timestamps in BT are generated by running a client-side JavaScript on the user's computer. So if the user's computer, uh, if that time is incorrect, then the in the wild timestamp will also show as incorrect. So this is another good example of understanding the source of your data and the meaning behind that data. Um, this is the second name and shame example that I have. Um, and it's from a, a blog or a white paper from Route 9 b um, that analyzes name servers and registrars. And they, um, they focus on APT28's preferred name servers and registrars. And in it, they erroneously concluded that APT28 was uh, planning a major attack on US financial institutions because they observed someone using uh, APT28's preferred name servers and registrars to, um, to register domains that were impersonating these financial institutions. There are a lot of things wrong in this paper, but I think that the root, of, the root cause of these analytic mistakes was that they failed to realize that the name servers and registrars were not unique to any one actor, and um, that they relied too heavily on data that they had a lot of access to. When they're looking at infrastructure-centric data um, that they had that was readily available to them, they failed to focus on other parts of the diamond model um, that had more useful data. Um, we as analysts can tend to place an inappropriate amount of weight on data that we have access to um, because we can see it, we can collect it, we can categorize it and analyze it. Um, and we often do this at the expense of other types of data that we don't have readily, ready access to. Um, but those data points are just as important. Okay, this is the last negative one. Um, and I can't really leave the section on attribution without talking about a Norse pew pew map. <laughs> and uh, their blog on pistachio harvest. So this, I think, again, highlights an over-reliance on the data that we have access to and the misinterpretation of that data. So in this scenario, Norse gathered um, a, a large amount of data from its global uh, collection of sensors. Um, it then filtered all of that data to highlight uh, uh, IP addresses that were coming from Iran. Um, it then interpreted the traffic that was coming from Iran, the pings and the scans that they saw. It interpreted those as malicious, and they also concluded that this indicated an eminent attack from Iran. Again, there's a lot of things wrong with this blog. But I think, it's, I think all of them stem from an over-reliance on a large volume of data that they had access to. Um, and in that, they assigned too much significance to the data that they had and that came at the expense of other data sources that they didn't examine. Um, so pivoting is hard. <laughs> I want to dive a little bit deeper and talk about um, some more complex analytic mistakes when we're looking at an adversary's capabilities. Um, one of the most common mistakes that I observed when researching this was uh, when researchers um, overestimate the uniqueness of an actor's TTPs, their capabilities. Uh, many of these capabilities are shared to an extent that analysts routinely underestimate. Um, and I, I like to call this sharing is caring. <laughs> 
um, one of the fundamental examples of this is malware. When we analyze malware, when we reverse malware, it generates an enormous amount of data. And we as analysts have access to an enormous amount of, of malware samples. VT is just one example. Um, and when generating this data, it can cause us to, to overfocus on the capabilities aspect of an adversary at the neglect of other more important data sources. Uh, so I want to highlight um, this really excellent blog from FireEye uh, that introduces the concept, or at least does a good job of elevating the concept of a digital quartermaster. And it, it was really a, a great way of explaining the phenomenon of why we observe Chinese group, like Chinese nexus groups, um, that seem to share malware that is not publicly available. Um, early on in InfoSec days, um, especially when we were looking at Chinese nexus actors, researchers would often assume that the relationship between a tool and an adversary was one-to-one, -one, so much so that the name for the malware and the main name for the group were often used interchangeably. But in this case, we see that TTPs are not unique. They can be shared. Um, an adversary can have access to more than one. Um, and they can be shared by adversaries that are running very different operations. The report goes on to analyze the concept of a shared builder, um, where there's customizable configs and they can be used by multiple actors. Um, builders, in this case, tend to leave um, digital artifacts, like metadata, for example. And this can cause analysts to conclude that a malware or um, several samples that are built by one builder are actually related to just one adversary. Um, the next one I want to highlight is um, a blog by uh, researchers at Shadow Server. Um, uh, this research reconstructed um, the, the, in, the um, APT campaigns that we saw occurring after the hacking team leaks. And that was when we saw two uh, flash exploits being released into the wild. And it kind of tracked uh, the way in which APT actors were adopting these into their campaigns over time. Um, and they noticed that sometimes they, these exploit kits seem to spread very quickly among closely associated groups. And in other cases, the exploit kits look very different from one another. And they even have a, a competing hypothesis chart. Um, and this really emphasizes um, the idea of one or more digital quartermasters that were responsible for uh, distributing these exploit kits. And I like the way that it, it shows us that vulnerabilities are not unique to any one adversary. Um, they can be shared in a number of ways that we have to consider. They can be sold, for example, um, or they can be uh, distributed by a common technical shop. And the last one I want to talk about for capability-centric analysis is a shared build environment. Uh, there's a lot of different examples um, and a number of, of, um, of artifacts that we can talk about with shared build environments, but I chose this Palo Alto blog um, on APT28 and some of the interesting metadata that they can leave in their phishing campaigns. So this is a Brexit-themed lore, uh, and the last modified name uh, is misspelled John with two O's. Um, what the Palo Alto blog doesn't include is an analysis of the company name. And this company name frequently occurs in APT28 phishing samples. And they don't include it because Grizzly777 is not an artifact that is unique to APT28 or any adversary, but it is unique to a specific build environment as this user found, you can buy it on eBay, and uh, it's indicative of a pirated copy of Windows 2007. And these kinds of digital artifacts um, can lead analysts astray uh, when they're trying to connect uh, capabilities and, and samples that aren't actually related. OK, I want to move into some more complex cognitive traps um, that we can run into when analyzing victim data. Victim data is another source of data that we as analysts tend to have access to a lot of, whether we're looking at uh, the targets of a large phishing campaign or we're doing an IR where a lot of companies are involved. Uh, we can gather data on verticals that are targeted, industries, uh, the job roles that people have, and even geography. And this, this abundance or overabundance of data can sometimes lead to what's called a collection bias. And one of the most common ones I see uh, for collection bias is a focus on telemetry. Uh, so the example, I, or the example I chose um, was this really great blog on Tidor malware um, by Trend Micro. And it's, um, what they did was uh, scan their customer sites for beacons that were indicative of Tidor malware. Uh, and they tell the reader that most of the victims that they found were discovered in Taiwan, and most of those victims were based in government organizations. Um, and we as analysts 
can look at this data and what they're, what they're saying is absolutely accurate. Um, and the, what they were expecting to find was, was true. And sometimes when people read uh, blogs like this, they can inaccurately conclude that, okay, Tidor malware only shows up at Taiwanese government sites. And that would be an inappropriate reading of this blog. Um, when we either read white papers or we evaluate our own internal data, we need to ask ourselves, is the victim list that we're seeing a function of our own visibility, or is it the true adversary's intended targets? Uh, this next example um, is one of my favorite analysts, uh, and he's talking about uh, an incident that happened actually last month in the Sea of Azov, uh, where Russia conducted a naval blockade uh, against Ukrainian ships and seized several of them. Uh, and the media take that, I don't know if you can see, so I'm just gonna read it. Uh, the media title is, Russia launches cyber attacks against Ukraine before ship seizures. And I think this is a good example of post hoc ergo prompter hoc, uh, which means after this, therefore because of this. And it's about our tendency to assume uh, that since one event followed another, it must have been caused by that event. Uh, and this is especially tempting because we as humans tend to think that correlation is causation. Um, but if we shift our focus away from the, the victim data that we have, the phishing emails and the, the ships that were seized, um, we, and we focus more on what we know about the adversary, um, we would realize that that conclusion doesn't make sense. And as Alex points out, that's just how Russia fishes Ukraine, um, because he's familiar with the operational tempo of uh, Russian phishing campaigns. Um, in, in the same way, he also knows that Russian military, the Russian military has an operational need to access the victims that they're targeting, and that operational requirement has predated uh, the actual naval blockade. So in this, in this case, he was able to discard that. Uh, the next example is really, really similar, uh, and it's cum hoc ergo propter hoc, or with this, therefore, because of this. I don't know Latin, and it's not important. Um, but I like to think of this as the popular victim problem, where uh, the victim is targeted by more than one adversary. Uh, in this particular example that I give, um, it was a hacktivist incident uh, in mid-2016 um, where several Vietnamese airlines and airports were targeted. Their websites were defaced, um, their PII customer data was leaked, and the PA system was hacked to play political messages. Um, and then the article goes on to describe uh, some phishing campaigns that were also identified around the same time, and even some, some C2 overlaps. Um, but this doesn't indicate that intrusion A and intrusion B have a causal relationship, even if they happen around the same time and target the same victims. Um, popular victims tend to have more than one adversary. And by focusing on this victim data, in this case the hacktivism and the phishes, um, we ignore key information about the adversaries. Um, this last one is about anchoring, and there's a much more in-depth presentation tomorrow on anchoring, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, but I, anchoring is a tendency to place too much weight on one piece of evidence at the expense of all other pieces of evidence. And more specifically, we as analysts tend to choose the first piece of evidence that we come across and measure all other pieces of evidence up against that first piece of evidence. So one example here um, of avoiding this analytic bias is um, a FireEye blog called Fish at the Request of Counsel. And it avoids um, anchoring as uh, an analytic stumbling block um, when it identified the, the difference between primary and secondary targets. Um, and it accur accurately concluded after evaluating both the adversary data and the victim data um, that a series of law firms, when they, were, when they were targeted by APT adversaries, that they were in fact a secondary target and not the actor's true intention. Um, in this case, the law firms uh, were targeted because of their client's data and not necessarily their employee data or internal data. And the next example I want to include is uh, WinNTI, and I can't really, I can really avoid WinNTI when talking about attribution. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to get too into the actual cluster that is one NTI, mostly because people don't even agree on how to pronounce it, much less what it is. Um, but I, what I do want to talk about is um, Kaspersky's blog very early on uh, where they analyze um, and use not just victim data but also malware analysis. Um, and 
uh, I like the way that they treated this campaign um, because just using victim data, we would be tempted to conclude that when NTI just really likes its video games because they are seen targeting video game companies so often all over the world. But using malware analysis, these gaming companies, Kaspersky realized, had code signing certs that were showing up in, in malware, indicating that the gaming companies were actually a secondary target and not the primary target. Okay, now we want to move on to adversary-centric analysis. And we'll stick with anchoring um, just for a bit more. This is one of my favorite examples because it's something that I believed for a long time. Uh, back in the day, there was this really old piece of Mac malware called Fruitfly. And the FBI released a flash on it a few years ago. And Malwarebytes also wrote a blog on it. Um, I knew of several high-profile victims that were targeted by this malware. And I spent a lot of time mapping out the infrastructure related to this. So I had a lot of victim data. And I had a lot of, um, I had a lot of IOCs and infrastructure data. Um, and because I was looking at cyber espionage for so long, and I thought I knew what I was doing, uh, I was pretty sure that this was associated with a large state-sponsored operation. Uh, Patrick Wardle did a DEF CON presentation uh, in 2017 um, where he extensively analyzed the C2, um, the comms, um, and the malware analysis completely reversed it. But he did a lot of research on the actor's patterns of life. And he gave um, an interview after his presentation where he concluded that the malware was most likely written and operated by a single hacker and that it was probably not sponsored by a nation state. Even with access to this better data, I still stuck with my initial conclusion that this was probably related to uh, a state-sponsored operation. So imagine my surprise when this guy from Ohio was arrested for writing the malware and running it on hundreds of victims for over 13 years. And this angering bias caused me to discount key pieces of evidence that I was given in favor of my initial assessment. And the last example I want to talk to you guys about is mirror imaging and North Korea. So mirror imaging is when an analyst assumes that an adversary thinks and behaves the way they do. And this can show up uh, when we rely on our own, ex our own experiences, our own previous jobs, or our personal histories. Um, when we're describing, um, we're describing how we think an adversary will behave. And these experiences, our personal experiences, can show up improperly in the analysis that we publish. I see this a lot with North Korea. Um, we like to joke about North Korean campaigns because they seem so outlandish and so out of the ordinary. They threaten to blow up theaters. They conduct billion-dollar banking heists. Um, and they, they, seem, they seem irrational to us. Um, but adversary-centric analysis requires us to step outside of our own experiences and set aside those mindsets. Um, when we gather data on the culture, the history, and the operational environments, for the adversaries that we want to observe and we want to analyze, um, we can come to very different conclusions. And by doing that, we avoid mirror imaging. So if you find yourself, if you find yourself saying, APT would or wouldn't do this, or if I were them, I would have done this, um, stop to analyze the sources of that analysis. Because it doesn't matter how you would run their operation. Um, our analysis will suffer when we're bringing a Western mindset or our own previous experiences into our assessments. Culture, organization, history, all of these affect the operations that we're observing. And they're as much, if not more, important than the data that we have on malware or infrastructure or victims. For example, for North Korea, an essential part of North Korean operations uh, and an essential part of their goals is avoiding state sanctions and, research, and raising hard currency. And knowing that about North Korea and North Korean state policy allows us to see their actions as not irrational, but as predictable. Knowing how North Korea funds things like its overseas embassies and its local businesses um, gives us insight into how cyber operations are, are organized and funded. So in conclusion, um, so how can we avoid some of these analytic pitfalls that we've described? Um, First, we need to understand where our data comes from, um, and more specifically, the limitations of our data. Find gaps in our knowledge, and then um, be comfortable with the idea that sometimes those gaps can't be filled. 
Second, acknowledge and avoid preferences for data that we have access to and that we're comfortable working with. Uh, start looking for missing data, and even if that data is hard to observe and hard to collect. And finally, correct for analytic bias by gathering context about the adversaries that we want to observe. These cognitive biases that we've discussed here negatively affect both our perceptions and our analysis, and they can really hinder our ability to describe reality accurately to both our customers and our decision makers. But, and the biggest problem with these analytic biases is they prevent us from making realistic predictions about the future to both our decision makers and our customers. And I think I have a little bit more time for questions.